Okay, we have now put together a central nervous system, and we are now ready to see what it does. Remember we talked about the four functions, perception, action, homeostasis, and abstract function. We are now going to assign those to, this, uh, to the central nervous system. And uh, before we get started, I, I just want to introduce this simplified diagram. This is not what the adult central nervous system of a human looks like but it does give us the various parts and now we can diagram it. So let me just go through this. This is spinal cord. The brainstem contains the midbrain and the hindbrain, which is the pons. The, the hindbrain is the pons, medulla, and the cerebellum. These are connected. The cerebellar hemispheres are connected down the middle, but I've split them so that we can see. Um, here's the uh, midbrain the, or mesencephalon, the diencephalon, which is going to be the thalamus and hypothalamus, and here are um, the two telencephalic hemispheres. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go right through sensory, motor, homeostasis, abstract function. Let's start with uh, sensory and motor. So the sensory inputs to the spinal cord are all the somatosensory inputs, and somatosensory means um, pain, temperature, touch, vibration, proprioception, that's somatosensory. Not a common uh, English word, but one that you absolutely need to learn. So the somatosensory from the body, the back of the head, and the neck, that all comes into the spinal cord. In addition, we get a lot of information from the viscera into our spinal cord. And, um, and then there is information from our face and the oral cavity going into our throat uh, um, that comes into the, the hindbrain. Hearing, information about hearing in the vestibular sense. The vestibular sense is where are you in space and how are you moving in space? Where's your head in space and how is your head moving in space? That's a vestibular sense. Taste comes in here. And then there's a lot of viscerosensory information that doesn't go into the spinal cord but goes into the brainstem. Okay, that comes in through the vagus nerve, which you may have heard of, one of the cranial nerves. So all of that sensory information is coming into the uh, hindbrain. No sensory information comes into the midbrain. Uh, vision comes into the diencephalon. Remember that the optic nerve is an outpouching from the diencephalon, from the thalamus. So that comes into the diencephalon. And then there is actually a sensory input that comes directly into the telencephalon, and that is olfaction. It comes directly from the nasal epithelium through what's called the cribriform plate into the olfactory bulbs, which are part of the telencephalon. So that's sensory. Sensory comes into every part of the nervous system with the exception of the midbrain. But it, it, in, in Bobby, because he had a, a lesion here, in, um, in the ponds, what he had was a perfectly, uh, perfectly fine vision and olfaction and disturbances in these, uh, in these other sensory functions. Motor outputs is a slightly different situation. For the spinal cord, it supports movement of the arm, movement of the trunk, and movement of the leg. That's it. Um, some neck movements. Neck is shared between the spinal cord and the hindbrain. The hindbrain also, uh, the, the, hind, the neck movements that the hindbrain is involved in are very specific. It's shrugging and turning your head. Okay, the rest of the neck movements are supported by the spinal cord. Speech and swallowing are supported by the hindbrain. So there are, uh, a, there are people that will have difficulties with speech. It's called dysarthria and diff difficulties with uh, swallowing called dysphagia. These um, can be caused by hindbrain lesions. Uh, facial expression, very important to humans. We make facial expressions. We communicate way more with facial expressions than with words, with the semantics of words. If I say something to you, depending on what my face, uh, how my face appears, you will interpret that uh, those words very differently. So I'm communicating more with my face than I am with the semantics of my speech. Facial expression is very important. It comes out of the hindbrain. Gaze control is a shared function of the hindbrain and the midbrain, and they share it in a very specific way. 
So the hindbrain is responsible for, for gaze that goes left, right, and uh, every other direction is supported by the midbrain. <clears throat> Chewing is another uh, activity that is supported by uh, the hindbrain. So when Bobby had a, his lesion, it was in the rostral hindbrain, and it affected all of this. So he couldn't do any of that. And in fact, the lesion impaired his midbrain control of gaze control also. So in the midbrain control of gaze control allows you to m move your eyes up and down, but because the eyelids are absolutely critical to, if you look up and you don't put your eyelids up, it's the same area that controls both your eyelids and the movement of your eyes, the extraocular muscles. So the only thing he had left was one of the, um, one piece of gaze control that was controlled by uh, the midbrain. Now, there are absolutely no motor outputs from either the diencephalon or the telencephalon. You cannot move. There are no motor neurons there. The only motor neurons are in the midbrain for gaze control, hindbrain for a lot of different things, and spinal cord for the, uh, for the body. Okay, so let's move on to homeostasis. The homeostatic uh, outputs, uh, actually, I should have corrected this. Okay, I, I apologize for not um, correcting this. In, I'm, I'm talking in the middle of 2017, and in the end of 2016, there was uh, a, a revolution that, <laughs> that occurred um, for something that I thought was actually handed down from God, but turned out to be um, an, an incorrect uh, guess on the part of some 19th century scientists. And that is that the uh, sacral, the spinal cord has has several sections to it. It's organized topographically, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. And then in the sacral cord, the autonomic outflow from the sacral cord was actually parasympathetic. That was the idea that we had for 150 years. And in, um, the, at the end of 2016, uh, from the lab of Jean-Francois Brunet, uh, we learned that these are, in fact, sympathetics. And we'll talk about that when, when we in, in the next section when we talk about the spinal cord. So, um, so I uh, apologize for that error. So these are sympathetics. Uh, everyone will still be thinking that they're parasympathetics because this is such a recent advance, but they are sympathetics. They go to the sacral organs. They go to the um, uh, bladder, the colon, and to the, the sex organs. And so injury down here is going to affect voiding either uh, urine or feces and uh, sexual um, performance. Um, there is sympathetics to the face and the body. This is things such as sweating, uh, changing your heart rate, uh, uh, constricting your blood vessels to elevate your blood pressure, and so on. Um, output from the, th from the brain stem is involved in producing tears, producing saliva, um, and to uh, parasympathetic, uh, parasympathetics that go above the hindgut, so above the colon, bladder, and sex organs. That all comes from the brainstem through that vagus nerve that, we, that, we, uh, that I mentioned before. Now, the midbrain has an outflow, autonomic outflow, that produces two pieces of, uh, of eye movement that are are responsible, that are needed for reading, for near vision, for any type of near vision, including reading. And this is accommodation, lens accommodation, the reshaping of the lens, and pupillary constriction. We will go into both of those at some length. Um, and finally, the diencephalon, the hypothalamus is actually defined as that part of the nervous system that controls hormonal release. And it, it comes up very early in evolution, and it still does that in us. It controls hormonal release. What kind of hormonal re release? Well, growth hormone and um, uh, ACTH and uh, thyrox th uh, thyroxin stimulating hormone. So all these different hormones that uh, come out of the, uh, out of the um, pituitary are their release from the pituitary is controlled by the hypothalamus. There are no homeostatic outputs from the telencephalon, no homeostatic outputs that go directly. So no motor outputs and no autonomic outputs.
Okay. Yes, you may. Okay, so now the final uh, of the fourth functions, uh, four functions is abstract function. And the, the brain is responsible for thought, emotion, motivation, uh, um, action, perception. Uh, all of that is, is, depends on the, the telencephalon. In point of fact, there is one important asymmetry. We mentioned it in the previous segment, and that is that the less left hemisphere is critical for speech production and for um, the understanding of complex speech, uh, complex speech comprehension. Some simple comprehension can occur on the right side. But complex speech com uh, comprehension and speech production uh, are uh, a product of the, of the left hemisphere. So those are the four functions. Now, what happens if, if there's a lesion somewhere along this line? We're going to call this the neuraxis, the, the, the axis of the central nervous system from the back end to the front end. And what happens if, if there's a lesion? Well, if you lesion the spinal cord, or for that matter, the, the peripheral nerves, there is, there's not, you don't rewire your sense of who you are. You may be very devastated. And in fact, of course, if you have a spinal cord lesion and you went from being um, uh, an athlete to being in, in, dependent on a wheelchair, you are gonna be very affected by that. But nonetheless, the person that you are is, is still there. That is still the person that, that that telencephalon has produced. So it has the least effect on selfhood. But it also has, uh, the downside is that it has the least chance for amelioration. What hap where you are a week after a spinal cord injury is pretty much where you're going to be 20 years down. You might be able to get back one, one more uh, muscle movement, or you might be able to get it back a little bit, but not much. In fact, where you are the day after is going to be much, uh, very similar to where you are 20 years later. Now, that is not to say that we can't cure a spinal cord, there are a number of, of robotic assists, prosthetics that can be uh, uh, that can be accomplished and have been accomplished for spinal cord injured patients, but that is it's not a scalable um, uh, product. It's not a scalable treatment. These are uh, treatments that cost many uh, millions and involve a lot of people and can be tried out as proof of principle on one or two people. Um, this is not something that's going to uh, go ahead and cure uh, spinal cord injured patients. That said, there are, um, there are uh, avenues being investigated that will uh, assist in the self-repair of the spinal cord. Uh, these haven't worked on a mass scale uh, to date, but there is always um, hope for the future. In contrast, if there's a lesion up in the telencephalon, and the typical lesion that one gets up in the telencephalon is, is a stroke. That's the most common reason that a person, a neur common neurological reason that a person ends up in the hospital. So this is going to have a huge effect on who you are. If you, and we'll look at this, if you, if you can no longer speak, if you, um, uh, if you become disinhibited all of a sudden, uh, the, the, you are not the person that you have been for decades. You've taken a radical departure from that person. It is going to have a huge effect on who you are, um, who you perceive yourself to be, and who other people perceive you to be. On the, po on the positive side, this has the greatest chance of amelioration, so you can get better from it. Strokes, um, oftentimes, uh, the person a year later or five years later, you can't tell. There's a, 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 a story, a memoir by Jill Bolte Taylor, who's a neuroscientist, had a massive hemorrhagic stroke. Well, she, she actually narrates it on Audible, uh, and I listened to her, her narrating it. And, you know, she couldn't, right after her stroke, she couldn't do that. So she's recovered a lot. Um, to my mind, I didn't know her before, but she seems perfectly normal. 
Uh, I cannot tell that her speech is impaired in any way. I don't think it is. So you can get very close to full recovery um, after a, a, a damage to the telencephalon. And so that's the, that's the good side. In between, if you have lesions in the, in the brainstem, there are intermediate effects. Intermediate as far as their um, effect on the self and intermediate uh, uh, on as far as their recoverability. Um, a they, they tend to uh, affect the self and not be particularly easy to recover from. Uh, one, one extra um, type of lesion I will mention, which is in, in the brainstem, particularly in the midbrain and a little bit to, to a certain extent within the diencephalon, you can get um, uh, lesions that impact the state of arousal so that you're, you're fine if you could wake up. And, and that has been um, something that uh, has led to, uh, in part, those patients are what is now recognized as minimally conscious state. So some proportion of the minimally conscious state patients ha are okay if they could get into a state of arousal. Um, okay, so now what we're going to do is this gives you an, a broad overview of where we're going. We're going to start with the spinal cord, then we're going to go to, to um, the output from the brainstem, the cranial nerves, then we'll talk about the brainstem, and then we'll talk about the forebrain, and, um, and that'll be that for, for anatomy. Oh, well, then we'll talk about plumbing. Okay, great.